Okay guys, today we're going to be talking about something just a little bit different, and that is backpacking. Now, generally, if you are a fan of the channel, you'll know that I spend a lot of time talking about survival and bushcrafting, but I do also spend a fair amount of time doing backpacking, and therefore, I've gotten some I've gotten some feedback and have some people that I've ran into in my life, primarily friends, that are asking for videos talking about backpacking and primarily how to get into it, like what gear priorities, what they need to concentrate on, and what they should focus on when they're looking to get into backpacking. And so today we're going to be going over my backpacking setup and really discussing just priorities. This isn't gonna be so much a video trying to get you to buy into any one brand, and you'll see that there's plenty of different brands in here, and really I'm gonna leave that up to the end user, you guys, to make that final choice, but rather today we're just gonna talk about and take a look at um, the sheer priorities, what you should consider, and what are vital for backpacking. Okay, so let's start out with the three top priorities, or the three parts to, the three priorities to we a well-rested night. That is probably one of the most important parts to backpacking, and especially if you're doing multi-stop, uh, you know, multi-mile backpacking excursions, is if you are going to be spending the night, you know, spending multiple nights out there, in order to have the energy to complete those next night, it's important, very important, to get an adequate amount of sleep and that that sleep is comfortable. Ultimately, what you want is a good night's rest to give you that energy and that recharge and that boost for the next day. So let's talk about the three components to making sure that you get a good night's rest. So we're gonna start with the outside because this is on the outside and that is the sleeping bag. Now, sleeping bags, I'm not particularly partial to any one brand or any one sleeping bag. This here is a Mountain Hardware Bishop Pass. This is a zero degree, so it's a pretty cold uh, rated sleeping bag, but the core essentials to sleeping bags that you wanna make sure, especially when you're doing backpacking, is that you get a either a sleeping bag or a quilt from a reputable company and that it is adequately temperature rated. And what a lot of people don't realize is that when companies, regardless to the manufacturer, make sleeping bags or quilts or anything for sleeping, they give it a temperature rating. And that temperature rating, though the marketers will say that that is a comfort rating, really you'll come to find out pretty fast that a comfort rating really is more of a you'll survive rating. So this bag here in particular, like I said, is a zero degree bag. And if you use this at zero degrees or right around zero degrees, you know, uh, in the low, you know, 10 to zero degree, uh, you will survive. But optimally, you will not be very comfortable in this bag without extra things such as, you know, Under Armour base layers, a coat, uh, you know, stuff like that you will have to add more insulation. So the reality is, if you use this at zero degrees, dressing accordingly, you will survive, but you will not be comfortable and you probably won't get adequate rest, especially if you're someone like me who doesn't have a lot of body fat as a natural insulator. So this is a zero degree bag, but in all reality, I probably wouldn't use this any colder than 15 above which for me, and in this particular circumstance, you know, being fall, this works just fine. This is plenty warm enough for me at night because right now we're dipping down into the uh, high, 20, high 20s, low 30s, so at night we get about 28 above, so this is plenty adequate for my particular conditions right now. So that is the sleeping bag. So moving on to the inside of the kit, we're gonna go over shelter next. And shelter, albeit was probably something I should have uh, talked about first, but shelter is very important. Uh, shelter obviously is the barrier between you and the outside world. So it's important to have a shelter that works for you. However, shelters are not as picky as sleeping bags. You don't necessarily have to go with the most expensive and you don't necessarily have to go with the absolute best of the best. Just make sure that once again, as previously discussed, you know, make sure that whatever you go with, 
So make sure that whatever you go with is adequately rated to, to your climate. So once again, if you're going out into the snow, make sure that you have a four season. If you're going out in the fall, you know, you can get away with a three season like this. The current one that I have in my backpack is the Alps Mountaineering Trail TP2. And I like the Trail TP2 because it's a, I would consider more a one and three quarters person tent, but it is super lightweight, it's super small, and it provides me a ton of room. Now, I've just talked about this tent before, and it is a ultralight, which means you have to have, it ha doesn't have any main uh, frame to it, so there's no like, um, there's no rods or there's no uh, real skeleton in this kit, so you have to build or you have to craft or you have to bring a some kind of hiking pole or you have to make a ridge pole for this. So that is a disadvantage, but it's very easy, especially with a knife and a hatchet to manufacture a ridge pole out in the woods, so I'm not really bothered by that. However, like I said, you want to take that into account, uh, but there are certainly good one-person tents. Another one that I would carry instead of the Trail TP2 if I was going to other places where I couldn't find a ridge pole or couldn't manufacture one would be um, the Alps Mountaineering Zephyr One Person, which is a little bit bigger than this one in pack down size, but is another perfectly adequate shelter. Similar to sleeping bags, tents are a little bit deceptive in name. So, like I said, this is a two-person, it even says two-person teepee, but tent on this uh, bag. But do understand that there's enough room in this when you set it up for two people, but not comfortably. So if you are wanting a comfortable night's rest, this two-person really is a one-person. And so when you start to look at tents, and this is something that a lot of beginners don't get, or they don't realize until they get a little bit more experience, that, uh, you know, generally in my mind, whenever I recommend tents, I always recommend a size up. So if you are a single person and you're going out, I generally recommend a two-person tent. Now, there are some circumstances where one person works, but by and large, I recommend a two-person tent. If you're going out with two people, I recommend a three person, three people, a four person. And so that's generally my recommendation when it comes down to tent selection is always go for a person more because what the company deems a two person tent means that you can cram two bodies in that tent and it'll work, but it's not gonna be comfortable, it's not going to be easy, and uh, yeah, it's just not gonna be a very fun time, so. That's my sentiment with tents. Of course, there are hammocks you can use. I don't have any hammocks here to show, and I'm not a very large hammock camping person, but hammocks are another option, and you can get multi-person hammocks, and that can work just fine as well. Uh, but that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother time. So moving on to the last part of sleeping, and this is the part that I say never cheap out on. This is probably gonna be the part that you're most inclined to cheap out on, or at least most people will be, especially beginners, and that is your sleeping pad. Sleeping pads can really make or break your experience, especially in spring, fall, and winter, because the biggest threat that you have in those three seasons are, is the ground. The air will be cold, it's true, but the ground is going to be colder, and the worst part about the ground is if you're gonna be sleeping on the ground, you know, using something like a sleeping bag and a sleeping pad, that ground is gonna be wanting to steal the heat away from your body. And not only that, if you're using something like a sleeping bag, the moment you lay down on that sleeping bag, most of these sleeping bags are made out of down. So when you lay on your sleeping bag, you're going to compress the down in it. When you compress the down that's in your sleeping bag, it loses a lot of its effective insulation value. So making sure that you have a really solid, really well put together, and really, and a, in temperature rating correct, sleeping pad is very important because the sleeping pad is what separates you from the ground and it can be that insulating layer for whatever part of your body is touching that pad and compressing your sleeping bag. 
So that is what I find very important about sleeping pads. Now, something you wanna look at when it comes to sleeping pads is the R value or the R rating, whatever you'd like to call it. And the higher the number, the warmer it is or the more insulation it offers. So this right here is not a cheap sleeping pad, but this is the Thermarest Neo Air X Therm. And this one has an R value of 6.9 which means it is definitely a winter rated sleeping pad, but at the same time, if you use it in temperatures and conditions like this, it goes really well with a sleeping bag like this. So it's gonna keep you, so it's going to keep you very warm and it's gonna keep you up off the ground and separated from the cold ground. So that is my spiel on sleeping pads. Now it doesn't have to be something like this Thermarest uh, Neo Air X Therm. You don't have to go with this particular sleeping pad, though I do recommend this one heavily because it is very effective and very small. But just make sure that you're watching your R value or your R rating and making sure that you are having a really that you get a, an appropriate number. Now in the summer, this is a little bit different. Like I said, if you're in the summer, you don't necessarily need something thick and serious like this. You can go with a lot lighter weight sleeping pad. And what I use in the summer is a Sea to Summit ultralight sleeping pad because it's a lot smaller than this. But that one has an R value or R rating of 1.3. So it's definitely not at all for cold temperatures. So that is my spiel on sleeping pads. Make sure you get one that is appropriate for your temperature. And if you're going out in the spring, fall, or winter, make sure you have a serious R rating to protect you from the ground and from the cold. Okay, so those are the three most important parts to making sure that you have a comfortable night's rest. And like I said, if you are doing any type of multi-day excursion, or if you're taking any time where you're going to be camping out overnight when you're doing your backpacking, making sure that you sleep well is very important because that helps boost your stamina, it helps you want to be out there, and it helps you overall enjoy your time out in the woods more. So I can't stress enough making sure that you have a good night's rest. And like I said, in adverse conditions or in colder climates, it's important that you factor in your equipment and make sure that you have appropriate equipment for that time out. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at a few of the other necessities that you will need when backpacking. So if my backpack will stay up here, the next part we're gonna be talking about is water and water purification. Now, there's two different types of backpacking that I consider, and that is dry and wet backpacking. And what I mean by that is if you're dry backpacking, you're bringing in something like a water purifier, if it's you know something like the Grail, or it can be other larger scale water purifiers or filters such as the Platypus Gravity Works 2 liter but you're bringing in some kind of water purification system to take water that is around you and make it into potable water for you to use while you're out. That is dry backpacking in my mind. And wet backpacking is where you're bringing in your own water. So if you're going to an area that doesn't have a ready or immediate access to water, you bring in water. So there's two different types of backpacking in that regards. And generally, I try to plan most of my backpacking to be dry backpacking because it's much lighter to bring in water purifiers as opposed to bringing in the water that you're gonna be using. In addition to that, you can also live off the water around you for a lot longer than bringing in, say, three liters of water. So either way, it will impact your decision. Generally, I try to recommend bringing in, if you're going for a dry style, if you're going in solo, bringing in something like a grail, or if you're going in with multiple people, bringing in something like a platypus gravity works is a really effective solution because it will purify enough water for multiple people. But something like this grail, it purifies about 24 ounces at a time, which isn't a lot, but if you have ready access to water, you can you know, take what you need, pour it into something like your bot, and you'll be good to go. So that's how I handle a dry situation. 
bring it over here, is how I handle a wet solution or a wet backpacking excursion would be with something like a water bladder. I know there are definite people who are not fans of water bladders. I'm not a huge fan of them either. They're not like my 10 out of 10 would recommend method, but they are pretty good and you can carry, you know, three liters of water pretty easily just right there. And you'd fill this up with water, of course, like at your home. And then you can go out and you have enough water for at least a day, maybe a little bit longer. So that's my general solution for wet backpacking is a water bladder. And with the water bladder, you can, you know, use that water, you can drink it, or you can put it into different things like pots and cook with it or hydrate food. So that is my solutions for dry and wet backpacking. Next, we're going to take a look at fire and then we're going to get into cooking solutions and food. So before we get into cooking solutions, I'll go over my fire solution here. And for me, when it comes down to backpacking, I like to keep it really simple. All I use is an MSR Pocket Rocket 2 for a heating element. If I'm not going to be using something like a firebox or if I'm not going to be starting a manual wood fire, which in a lot of places you can certainly do, but depending on the type of backpacking, you may not be able to scrounge up enough wood or you may not want to keep a fire going. In addition, if you want to keep a fire going, you generally have to have the tools to harvest wood from your surroundings. So going with something like this is a nice option because you don't have to worry about bringing in, you know, an ax or a hatchet or a saw to process wood. You just bring in your little fire. You just bring in your little element for fire and for cooking. So if you're looking for something to do cooking, I generally recommend the MSR Pocket Rockets, but really there are a whole bunch of different ones. There's the Mighty Mo by Jet Boil, and there's many different types out there that do the same basic function. The only thing I like to look for when I look for elements for fire starting is I like to make sure that they can go or that they can run fairly low because there are quite a few uh, aluminum pieces of cookware that I use that, you know, if I just go full blast will definitely damage that equipment. Same with titanium stuff. So you'll want to be you know, mindful of what your expectations are and what you need out of your piece of equipment and what you're going to be cooking with when it comes to your heating element. So, you know, this might be perfectly fine for this bot, but, you know, some thinner aluminums might struggle with this, depending on how hot you burn it. So, anyways, this is my current cooking solution. Like I said, it's the MSR Pocket Rocket with just a fuel canister. This just so happens to be one of my jet boil fuel canisters because I already have a bunch of these for my jet boil. And then of course the jet boil uh, fuel canister stand. So that's what I use and of course I keep it all in my Vargo titanium bot if I'm running dry like this. It's a great solution because I can throw everything in here and forget about it. So. That is the basics to my fire. Okay, so now let's move over to cooking solutions. So we've talked about fire, and lastly, we're gonna get over to cooking and how to take the food that you have and cook with it. So like I just mentioned, and of course, in here is my fire setup, but I do carry my Vargo bot, titanium bot. It's a great, super lightweight, super lightweight system and it works really well for me but in addition to that of course the bot isn't an all-encompassing thing if you want to cook maybe more hearty meals like you want to have some oatmeal that's where this solution comes in so it's nothing too impressive but i have a snow peak titanium plate here for some food and cooking up stuff and then in here i have the bsa uh, or boy scouts of america mess kit here so this is pretty basic but it allows you to have a nice little skillet another plate uh, a pot and a small mug now this is pretty small stuff so i'm not going to say that wow this is all you need but especially if you're one person this is a pretty good option because i have two pans for cooking and then I have you know kind of a small makeshift skillet small pot and a mug in here so really all my bases between the bot 
the plate and this cook kit or mess kit, I really have everything I need to cook any different type of food that I need. Once again, with something small and aluminum like this, you do want to make sure that you're cautious with the amount of heat you're putting on um, on this type of equipment. But once again, the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 goes down pretty low and can really simmer stuff as opposed to just being full tilt like a jet boil. So something to keep in mind when you're picking your uh, fire uh, method, but also something to keep in mind when you're picking your type of uh, what you're going to be using to cook your food in. And as always, uh, there are plenty of options when it comes to mess kits and cook stuff. This is just my method. Of course, there are many different things out there. There's a lot of cool aluminum stuff nowadays uh, for camping cookware. So you don't have to necessarily choose this exact setup. Though I do, as always, recommend the Vargo Bot because these things are amazingly useful. They offer a lot of advantages that a bottle does and a lot of advantages that a pot does. And that's why the Vargo Bot exists. And being that this is titanium, it is super lightweight. And once again, it makes a perfect housing for a fire kit. You know, it just fits right in there. So really love this setup and I don't think I'll be getting away from it because it's all things considered reasonably light and it offers me a ton of versatility when it comes to cooking different meals and different stuff. So that is my cooking setup. Okay so moving on to the last part that you really need for backpacking is food and with food everyone's going to have different ideas about food and this isn't to dispel a mountain house meals if you want to go that way or MREs or mountain house meals those are just fine and they work however you'll find that they are a little bit heavy and they are expensive so I generally stay away from mountain house meals and MREs I don't really like those styles of meals they're also super processed and not very healthy for you but that's another discussion for another time so what I generally do <clears throat> what I generally do for backpacking meals is I break it down into two things or two different kind of arenas there are your snacks and then there are your meals so for snacks I usually go with something like cliff bars energy bars uh, just any kind of bar that's like this you know they have pretty high caloric intake uh, for their size. I think most of these um, cliff bars are about anywhere from 240 to 260 calories per bar. So you can get a pretty decent amount of you know meal out of just one or two of these. And so if you're snacking on these, that's pretty good. And so like I said, I have multiple flavors of cliff bars, different energy or nut fruit and nut bars like these. Of course these are a little bit crushed because that's what happens. But you know, stuff like these, which are once again 140 calories per bar, just pretty good. So that's what I consider snacks. Then moving over to meals are where I get a little bit different, and that is stuff like this. And so what I'll do is I'll take, you know, like a gallon size Ziploc bag, and I'll put, you know, about a pound or two pounds of things like couscous. In this particular case, this is couscous. And I'll have this, and of course, once again, if I'm hiking into a place that has water, I'll have water to cook this couscous with. And then usually, if I can find them here, I'll carry some different spices. And this is a pretty easy and popular thing that a lot of people do. You can just take some straws, put, you know, about a serving size, or about how much you would normally use to cook something like this of your spices in here in little, um, in little straw kind of containers and so I'll usually throw some like chili pepper and some different cayenne and uh, other types of spices and stuff like that in here and I will just take these and add them to the couscous as it's cooking so that's what my option is or what I do for meals with backpacking it's lightweight it's cheap it's easy and like I said, it, it really is, there's a lot of pros to doing this and uh, that's what I usually do. However, there are certainly plenty of options to eat and so I'm not gonna try to sell you on any one particular method or means of eating out in the woods, there are plenty. So that is what I do for eating and 
with that, that is basically all you need for backpacking. And as I almost forgot to mention, last but not least, when it comes to backpacking, is a solid backpacking uh, backpack. Almost the whole name of it is backpacking. So when it comes down to a backpack, once again, I'm not going to try to sell you on any particular brand or any one backpack. But generally, my recommendations when it comes down to a backpack that you're going to think for doing some lighter day trips and maybe some multi-day excursions would be a minimum of a 26 liter backpack or around, around 26 liters to 4,000 cubic inches, depending on which way you want to measure it should be adequate. The biggest thing I recommend when it comes to a backpack, which is actually fairly hard to find nowadays, is that it has a solid bottom for strapping things onto. As you can see, this is jerry-rigged. This is by no means the factory system of doing this, but this backpack does have straps or little parts down here, loops to hold on straps so you can strap things to the bottom of your backpack. So like I said, a backpack that has about a has about 26 liters to 4,000 cubic inches of storage space is a good place to start. Uh, 4,000 cubic inches is a little on the big side in my opinion, but 26 liters is about how many liters that this pack pack is. And like I said, it allows you to carry just about everything you need. Now, there is still some empty space on both sides here. And so I could put a few extra things, probably nothing too crazy, and obviously the backpacking equipment will take up most of your space, but that's what you want to focus on with a backpacking backpack. You also want to make sure that it's comfortable and it feels good to you. I personally love the now long discontinued Camelback Lynchpin. This is kind of my go-to backpack for everything. However, if I did need to step up to a probably bigger more burly backpack if I was doing like a multi-day excursion and I really needed extra storage I would go over to my uh, mystery ranch crew cab which has a lot more storage than this particular backpack by a substantial margin because that pushes into like over 6,000 cubic inches but for most realistic backpacking uh, especially like I said day trips and where you're just doing overnighters this is a really good option uh, something around this size is a really good option you just want to make sure like I said you can attach things to the bottom of the backpack because if you can't do that then you won't have much space for something like a little bit more hefty sleeping bag like this because these sleeping bags as you get into more cold rated sleeping bags like these they tend to get pretty big and pretty bulky so that's why I don't really like keeping my sleeping bags on the inside of a backpack is because like I said as as you get into colder rated back or sleeping bags they get pretty big and you can see how this uh, zero degree bag here is almost as big as my backpack so certainly uh, not a tiny sleeping bag by any means, but that's why you can strap it to the bottom of your backpack and it's not at all heavy, it's just big and bulky. So anyways guys, that is finishing it up for my backpacking. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully it's brought you guys some value. And like I said, hopefully this answers any questions, gets you guys into backpacking and kind of shows you the minimum requirements of what you need because like I said you know past this point of everything that I just mentioned uh, it's really all optional so this is the basic stuff that you need to actually backpack but if you want to add things like pillows if you want to add things like you know camp chairs whatever you know those are more convenience items that might make your time out better but you certainly don't need them for a comfortable night's rest you certainly don't need them for you know a time around the fire uh, those are definitely convenience level items so everything that is necessary for a comfortable time out in the woods was just mentioned so anyways guys that has been my experience hopefully you've enjoyed this and as always as you guys probably already are definitely leave your recommendations your experience your feedback in the comment section below i'm always curious to learn from you guys because I know there's probably quite a few backpackers that are subscribed to the channel and that can add their own insights and while I'm more of a fan of survival and bushcraft that tends to be my staple I certainly do backpack and I enjoy 
coming out in the woods and just sleeping without any kind of kind of a leave no trace mindset so it's certainly a fun time either way and as always guys god bless and i'm out